I've played a plethora of various video games over the years, and for most of them, I like to think I have a pretty good mental image of what that game is. Sometimes it's really good, other times it's really bad. Sometimes it's stuck in the middle, and I find myself outright ignoring it because... just why? But there are some games that don't fit nicely into those categories. Those that are a strange enigma that I can't properly place said mental image foggy. It's mildly funny for me then that the game that gives me this feeling the most is from a series that I adore so much. To me, Metroid 2 is strange. It was a game that, for the longest time, I had heard nothing about. While I would hear the praises of Super Metroid and Zero Mission growing up, as well as the various notes of disappointment regarding Fusion, I never heard much of anything about this game that felt seemingly forgotten. As time went on, and as things tend to happen, the game was given another look over in the form of remakes. I say that in plural, because after the release of Zero Mission on the Game Boy Advance, various fans and fan groups decided to give that same kind of treatment to Metroid 2. However, despite the sea of Metroid 2 remakes being worked on, only two different remakes of the game emerged. An official remake made by Mercury Steam, which released on the 3DS in 2017, and the other, a fan remake aptly titled AM2R, or another Metroid 2 remake. I'm not here to talk about either of those, because that is its own can of worms that I am not interested in looking into right now. I want to talk about the original. The game that so many people thought needed an upgrade, that had got too. Going into Return of Samus, I am about as blind as I was with the NES game. Much like with Metroid, I had played the official remake beforehand. With Metroid on the NES, it was Zero Mission. With Metroid 2, it was with Samus Returns. But much like before, just because I've played the remake doesn't mean I know what I'm getting myself into here. And having now played the game, oh boy did I not at all. Metroid 2 Return of Samus was developed by R&D1, which stands for Research and Development 1, for those unaware. The game was developed for the Game Boy, which was also a creation of R&D1. Because it turns out when the people who make a game also have an intricate knowledge of how the hardware works, they tend to make games that make good use of said hardware. The original Metroid was great. It had a lot to work with and a lot that needed improvement. That said, moving the game over to the handheld had some limitations that would, funnily enough, drastically change the future of the series. To start, the Game Boy had a much lower screen resolution, which meant compared to the NES, they had about half the space to work with. The screen was monochrome, so everything had to be shades of gray or green, the Game Boy model depending on that. Or gray with both if you're colorblind. There were also the issues of it being a handheld, a platform that benefited more from quick sessions of play when you had a chance compared to the longer play sessions a console would be better suited for. But even all of that didn't discourage R&D 1. In fact, it may as well have been a challenge, considering what they delivered with the game. Metroid 2, above all else, does so much to improve upon the first game. The immediate thing you'll notice upon starting the game is the design of Samus. You take up a fair amount of the screen, giving the game an almost cramped feeling at times, which works surprisingly well to the game's benefit and its atmosphere, Compared to the first game, Samus' suit is much more detailed here as well, a response to the lack of color the Game Boy was able to supply. It's an overall improvement in my book, though. And we can't talk about improvements without going over the controls. Yes! After having played so much of NES Metroid, the moment I realized I could shoot down was like getting a booster shot of dopamine. The feeling of being able to crouch on top of that? Damn, is this what overdosing feels like? <laughs> okay. Samus feels better, more intuitive, snappier in one way or another. But most of it likely has to do with how floaty you are. Sure, on the NES, Samus felt floaty to begin with, but here it's much more pronounced. 
I do find that it works to the game's benefit, however, as it allows you to react quicker to things happening around you mid-jump, especially helpful with the smaller screen. Metroid 2 takes place after the first game, but with a healthy amount of time in between the two that's not disclosed to the player. While the game itself doesn't explain what's happening while you're playing it, you're able to infer enough from general context clues what your goal is supposed to be here, the eradication of the Metroid species. Only two games in and we're killing off our title creature, huh? Eh. See, after the conclusion of the first Metroid game, the Galactic Federation sent out a research ship to the planet SR388, the planet that the Metroid species originated from. With the Federation now keenly aware of the danger these things presented, the decision was made in order to possibly do something about that. So a uh, short time after they sent out this research ship with the mission to ensure there were no more Metroids left on the planet, they lost contact with the research team. They sent various other groups to try and find the missing research team, but they were all never heard from again. At this point, the task of heading to SR388 and eliminating the threat of Metroids falls to Samus, who is chosen to deal with the issue due to her experience with the creatures. Or more accurately, she's the only one who could feasibly survive these things, as shown before. The story is laid out in the manual much like the first game, and much like then, the background story is nice to have, but the extra details don't have a major impact on how things go. You don't even find anything to do with the research team or any of the other groups sent out in search of them throughout the journey. Just a lot of background lore that's sort of, but not really important. SR388 is very different compared to Zebes from the first game, compared to the winding and interconnected labyrinth that had you backtracking into previous areas to get new items and paths forward, SR388 is a much more linear track. Make no mistake, while the map of Metroid 2 is much more straightforward, it's still a maze. Each section of the map can be just as confusing as the first game's areas were, and in some cases more so. The game has a much better handle on the level design, at least in my opinion. Compared to the first game, I was never stumped on if one hallway was actually another. Everything feels unique and different enough that the basic surroundings shouldn't leave you lost. That said, there are other problems that fill that hole now. The first game might have left me confused as to what area of the map I was in, but that was due to the level design being basically the exact same. Return of Samus found a way to make it arguably worse, as the map seemingly folds in on itself in ways that should not at all be possible on a 2D plane. I've been in rooms that I've sworn took up spaces where others had been, and while it's normally not an issue, when you find yourself with only one Metroid remaining in an area that you swear you've swept through entirely already, that, kids, is the ramping urge to throw both myself and this game into the sun. But as aggravating as those moments are, they aren't a frequent issue. It's just unfortunate that whenever you do end up encountering those things, it seems to always be whenever it disrupts things the most. Aside from navigation, the design of SR388 helps enforce one of the biggest aspects of Metroid 2, the feeling that everything's just a little bit too cramped? While there are big open areas and shafts that you can jump up from, everything feels very compact. This whole planet feels like a cave system that you are not supposed to be trespassing upon, and it shows. As I said earlier, while the main path down might be a straight shot, you do have to go through various offshoots from that path in order to progress further. Unless you clear out each of these areas, you aren't getting any deeper into this planet. So, I suppose it's a good thing that the further you go in, the more power-ups become obtainable. SR388 is a very hostile planet, as shown by the plethora of groups going missing while on this planet. As with all good Metroidvania games, the more power-ups you get, the more you can progress. But Metroid 2 is a bit weird in that respect, as unlike before, you're not doing much, if any, backtracking in order to advance. Every power-up you get is handed out in a place that is either convenient to have, or is necessary to progress onwards. 
There's even power-ups that aren't required, but certainly feel it when some do as much as they do. Let's start off with the returning power-ups. Energy tanks make a return, same as last time, they fill you up to full whenever you pick one up, and they add another 100 energy to your maximum. Missile upgrades are the same, increase your missile count with each instance. Missile upgrades are some of, if not the most important upgrade you can get, as they are required in order to do anything productive in this game. The standard affair for beam types are back, the ice and wave beam specifically. Unlike with the first game, the long beam doesn't exist anymore, and instead seems to have just been added onto the standard power beam you have at the start. Beam types don't stack yet, as getting one upgrade replaces the old one. Clearly, a concept far ahead of our time. Your morph ball and bombs make a return, including the ability to bomb jump, albeit seemingly with a bit more finicky timing this time around. And of course, there's the screw attack, once again trivializing late game enemy encounters because, hey, someone had to. But it wouldn't be a new game without new upgrades or cool new takes on old ones. Okay, it wouldn't be a good one. Let's start off with the first major one you get, the Spider Ball. The Spider Ball is an upgrade to the Morph Ball, allowing you to stick to the surface you're on without fear of pesky things like gravity. It's great for climbing up walls, although the controls are a bit wonky in how you move once it's activated. You're no way near as fast as the standard Morph Ball, but the Spider Ball requires a bit more methodical use anyways, as many of the surfaces you need to ascend are usually being circled by various different enemies in SR388 to delay your progress, so the slower speed typically helps. It also pairs really well with the Morph Ball jump, which, well, lets you jump when in the Morph Ball. Then we have the Space Jump. With perfect timing, you're able to continue jumping through the air for, well, ever, assuming you can get the timing down. Then we have more beam types being added, each flavor adding something new to your toolset. The Spacer Beam splits your beam in three, widening your range of attack not unlike the Wave Beam, but with the beam split into three, it has more odds of doing some good damage. Then we have the Plasma Beam, exchanging area of effect for damage. The Plasma Beam fires only one shot, much like the Power Beam, but anything it hits will basically be disintegrated. And lastly, while not a new power-up, well, it might as well be seen as such. The Various Suit is technically a missable upgrade, as you're not required to get it to proceed, and it's actually hidden away for you to find. The suit majorly reduces the damage you take, and while it's technically not required, this fact sure as heck makes it feel like it is. Originally, when I was doing my run of the game, I was worried I'd miss it, but I actually ended up stumbling across it while I was lost. Due to the Game Boy's lack of a color display, a simple palette swap like with the first game's various suit wasn't going to work. As a result, the design of the suit had to be drastically changed, and by that, I mean they actually had a given one. This design would very quickly take over as the version of Samus many remember, with the large shoulder pads and more bulky stature. It's glorious. But all of these items serve a purpose. The eradication of the Metroids is not an easy task. But there's no one else that can do it, so... When you first make your way down SR388 and reach this split in the path, you might find your way to this pit of acid here. A dead end that you could try and brave, but you'd be dead before you could make any real progress. Taking the other path will lead you to the first Metroid, the first of many, and... Oh, that bodes poorly for me. <laughs> Fun fact, SR388's atmosphere directly affects the cycle of life for Metroids. The ones we've seen up to this point have only been their larval state. Each Metroid we'll run into on our way deeper in will be one that has progressed further through this cycle. So, meet the Alpha Metroid, the first in this line of changes. Thanks to the benefits of evolution, the Alpha Metroid has dropped its weakness to freezing temperatures, making the usual plan of freezing them and shooting them with missiles until they die a thing of the past. Only the difference is now that instead of freezing at first, you just need to blast it with missiles until it dies. 
The Alpha Metroids are arguably easier to deal with than standard Metroids. They might have a much smaller target to hit now compared to before, but their only means of attacking is ramming into you, and even then they still take about 5 missiles to defeat like with their larval state. Once this Alpha is defeated, you'll have a moment to breathe, before the environment begins to shake and the Metroid counter on the bottom right of your screen starts freaking the hell out at the beating you just hit that Alpha Metroid with. In actuality, this is merely the game letting you know that you've defeated all the Metroids in that area. You can actually check how many are left in an area by pressing start, which is something I didn't realize until way too late into my own run. And with said shaking, it also means you can progress deeper in, as that pit of acid that had stopped your progress earlier has lowered with the destruction of the Metroid in the area. And from there, that's the general game plan going forward. Each area will block off the path heading deeper with acid, so you need to traverse the areas next to them in order to find the Metroids hiding within and destroy them to lower said acid. The majority of Metroids you'll encounter near the start are the Alpha Metroids, but seemingly around the time you get a good grip on how to easily take them down, you encounter their next stage, Gamma Metroids. These guys are a bit tougher than the Alphas, they take more missiles, but they also have another method of attack, this weird energy beam thing. This actually lets them block incoming missiles you fire at them, which is an annoyance that I also did not realize was happening until way too late. As you progress through SR388 and run into the various Metroids, you'll start to notice these husks left over from their metamorphosis, helpfully noting that there's a Metroid nearby for you to hunt. These helpful signs aren't always there, and as you go deeper, the surrounding enemies get a bit tougher to deal with, though in some cases, it's less because they're actually stronger and more because they're just a bit more annoying. The deeper you go into SR388, the more the enemies begin to get smaller, or more mechanical. I've seen people online see this as if the Metroids have sucked away the energy of these species to such an extent that all that's left is whatever these are supposed to be. One way or another, SR388 is not safe the deeper you go in. That idea is further established with your first introduction of the Zeta Metroids, who take more missiles than the Gammas and the ones that I legitimately have no clue how they work. They fly around with what feels like a wonkier RNG than the other Metroid types, and with a smaller hitbox compared to the Gamma Metroids, they are easily one of the most annoying kinds of Metroids to fight. They also swap out the lightning bit the Gammas do for a fireball, which is different but just another thing you need to keep track of while fighting them. It's thankful that they aren't as plentiful as the Gammas and Alphas, it's also thankful that the next stage comes in soon after, the Omega Metroids. These guys. I expected these guys to be bad. Not in like a design way, more in a difficulty kind of way. I expected to fear my encounters with them, and in a way I did, but not for the reason I was expecting. These guys are a test of patience. Taking even more missiles to defeat than the Zeta Metroids, Omegas will destroy Samus unless you're taking as many preventative measures as you can. Sure, you could try and blast them with missiles at point blank without a care, but it likely wouldn't get you anywhere. It certainly didn't for me. The only strategy I found that had me ensuring victory at every turn was the one where I'd take pot shots whenever I had a free moment to do so. Whenever I wasn't doing that, I was busy screw attacking to save my life. The screw attack makes you invincible, but you still have a window to be hit the moment you get out of it and Omega Metroids are constantly up in your face to capitalize on that. The amount of times you'll face an Omega Metroids are small. I remember roughly five encounters with them maybe, but each are strongly remembered due to just how close those fights could go. It's around this point, when you're near the end and the Metroid count is in the single digits, that you realize very quickly that you do not have enough missiles. Or, more accurately, you will run out of missiles after one fight with a Metroid, and then have no reliable way to refill them before the next fight. The enemies that are abound in the late game areas are so stingy with drops that I am 95% sure that none of them drop missiles, period. I had to trek back through the whole area and brave a quarter of another just to reach a missile recharge station so I'd feel prepared to face down another Metroid. It's not as bad as the health grinding of the first game could be, but this isn't an improvement. 
Like, you could go to the bathroom to dry heave, but just because you're not vomiting doesn't mean that you aren't just as sick. Once you've finally defeated all the remaining Metroids, there's only one place left to go. The lair of the final Metroid. Now, standing here at the heart of your mission, it's time to finish the job and hunt down the last remaining- Oh, come on! So much for the last Metroid. Now we gotta deal with all these guys. I do like that the larval Metroids get a chance to shine here. Not much has changed with them, they still take the same amount of punishment as they did in the first game, hitting them with the ice beam and then finishing them off with five missiles, but after going through and taking down their evolved brethren, it felt less like a challenge and a lot more like busy work. Of course, because each Metroid takes five missiles to destroy them, by the time you're left with one Metroid left to take care of, you're going to be running a bit low on missiles if not out completely. So, after making one more run back to replenish missiles and health, it's finally time to finish the mission. And to do that, well, time to fight a very angry mom. The Metroid Queen is tough. It stays at the left side of the room pretty much all of the time, but with a neck that will extend the entire screen so it can bite you in half, various projectiles that you'll need to avoid, and an overall high damage output, you'll be struggling to figure out how to deal with her. I know I was, and I died trying to figure out how to properly put her down. I died admittedly a few times trying to do that, but each step taken was another closer to finishing this game. Missiles need to be fired at her face to deal damage, and while that's effective, it's not the only method available. When the Metroid Queen moves to try and chomp down on Samus, you can fire into the Queen's mouth to stun it momentarily. When you do that, you have a brief window where you can morph into a ball and roll into the stomach. While normally the idea would be counterproductive, here it's the opposite, as laying dozens of bombs inside the Queen's stomach deals massive damage to her. Just be sure to be quick about it, otherwise the damage you'll receive from being inside the Queen's stomach will quickly rack up. But eventually, after all that fighting, all that time spent trying to figure out just how to defeat the Queen, she will eventually succumb to your violent machinations and die. Standing in front of the rapidly dissolving body of the last Metroid, the Metroid counter ticks down to zero. Having now completed her mission, Samus heads off back towards her ship. However, it's during this trek that she runs into one slight hiccup. As an egg, the last one laid by the Metroid Queen, bursts open in front of the bounty hunter. This Metroid, the baby, seemingly imprints onto Samus, and from there the trip becomes one with company, as Samus returns to her ship with this Metroid in tow. It's profound and strange in a way. I've seen this moment dozens of times before, across many of the games and their retellings of it, but there's something different about this version. As much as I think it would have been neat if the counter increased back to one when the baby hatched, even then I don't think there's much to complain about it not doing that. You reach the surface of the planet once more, hop into your ship, and the game ends. The credits roll, your time is displayed, and depending on said time, you'll get a different ending, much like the first game. Metroid 2 The Return of Samus Having played through it for this video, my feelings on it are jumbled. I like this game. I like it a lot. But unlike with the first game, where once I had finished the game, I was at least somewhat excited to possibly give the game another run through, see if I could beat my previous time and all that, I didn't share that feeling with this game. When I beat it, upon seeing the credits, I simply put my controller down and just sighed in relief. My immediate thought wasn't to go back in, it was relief that I was done. It was like, wow, that was great, but I am not going through with that again, not for a long, long time. Metroid 2 is a slog. I say this now because it's only once I had fully finished the game did that fact become apparent to me. The game is great, and at the very least I'd recommend giving it at least one playthrough, but it is not perfect and the game does turn into a slog around the halfway point all the way up to the final boss. Having played the game, I fully understand why this game had so many eyes on it when it came to remakes, why so many people believed it needed one. There's a reason this game was forgotten by many over the years, and while I'm happy it got another chance to make its mark through remakes, I'm also glad to have seen and experienced it for myself in the original form. 
Of course, even with all that, the main reason I believe this return was forgotten was because basically two years later, we received a game that overshadowed it completely. A game that is still looked at as the gold standard of Metroid games by many. A game that I really do need to finally sit down and beat. Thank you all so much for watching. This took me a lot longer to get out than I expected. If you liked the video and haven't yet seen my previous video on Metroid for the NES, might I suggest checking that out? And if you liked what you saw in general, why not like and subscribe? I'm debating introducing content to the channel past the critiques, possibly some let's plays of some kind as an example, just to make sure content isn't as spaced out as this has been. Thank you all so much for watching, and hopefully, I'll see you all next time. Janet.